Hi, this is Ben Kissling, and this is episode 12 of my video series on William Lane Craig and Genesis. We've been reviewing um, Craig's video and lecture series called Excursus on Creation of Life and Biological Diversity. But, as I mentioned in the last episode, uh, Craig's book on the historical atom has come out. Uh, it came out last week. Uh, I finished it last Saturday. It's Friday today. Um, so this is going to be a sort of rapid reaction, initial reactions that have been fleshed out just a little bit. So it's half fresh. It's a half fresh review of the book. Um, <laughs> um, I thought I'd do this now because, um, well, I'll get into that. Um, so. For the rest of the video series, I th before I read the book, I thought I was going to finish out the video series by just switching over to a critique of the book. I had reached a stopping point where I had sort of finished Craig's sessions on his biblical hermeneutic. Uh, but as you can see here, the subtitle is A Biblical and Scientific Exploration. And in the class, parts 27 through 34, are the section where Craig focuses on science. Um, when I started the video series, I was going to do that sort of as its own section. There's lots of stuff in, that Craig brings up in the classes that I wanted to talk about. So I figured I'd just switch over to the science section of the book uh, and to finish out the video series. But after reading the book, uh, I'm not going to do that. And there's some specific reasons why. Um, in the class, Craig mentions a bunch of stuff that I wanted to talk about. It was interesting. He mentions intelligent design theory. He has a whole section on intelligent design theory. He mentions his own view of progressive creation. I wanted to get into that because progressive creation is a increasingly common view, I think, among Christians, especially intelligent design people and old earth creationists like Craig. Um, and I think there's some legitimate uh, critiques that need to be brought up about progressive, progressive creation because it's not talked about a whole lot. Um, in the book, Craig doesn't mention progressive creation at all or intelligent design theory. Now, there's a couple of things I'll talk about later that sort of hint at it, but it's just they're just not in the book. It's not part of the thesis of the book. Um, so. I am probably going to continue on critiquing the class and referencing the book. So the structure of the rest of the video series will remain unchanged from what I intended previously, um, but I will be referencing the book in some point at some point. So this right here, though, is the only episode I'm going to focus on the book. Um, so in general, the critique that I've offered in the previous 11 episodes mostly still stand. Um, however, there are several things that Craig has slightly adjusted his argument, or there's a few things that it's more than a slight adjustment. Okay, so we're going to discuss. I'm going to discuss seven points of agreement. And to avoid traumatizing people, I'm just going to list all seven right now. So you're not like, which is number seven? Which is number six? Okay, so the seven points of agreement are as follows. First, Craig admits that the young earth creationist position is the traditional interpretation and that um, old earth interpretations or alt any alternate interpretations are recent. This is a change from what he said in the class, uh, where he was entertaining the idea that, you know, some of these ancient Christians, patriarchs were old earth or day age theorists, I think, which is impossible. That's not the case. As I argued previously, I believe in episode um, three or four, Craig's accepted that, basically said, look, Young Earth creationism is the traditional interpretation. Any other interpretation is recent, and he even calls it revisionist in the preface. Okay, so that's an important admission. 
and you know, good on Craig for not contesting that point when it's pretty obvious. All right, uh, number two, he accepts as he did in the class after spending two and a half classes pretty much on this question in the book, he breezes by this in basically a single paragraph and basically admits that the days in Genesis 1 are meant by the author to be uh, tw literal 24-hour, he calls them solar days, 24-hour days, which his uh, terminology there that they're solar days might give him an out into saying, well, since the sun didn't exist until day four, I can w I have wiggle room there. But in general, Craig has just blown by this point and admitted that these are twenty these are twenty four hour days. Uh, not in the class. Uh, in the class, he admits that the flood in Genesis six through nine was meant by the author to be a global flood. And he, in the book, he actually spends quite a lot of time taking none other than old Earth creationist Hugh Ross from Reasons to Believe to task on this question, and he critiques Ross's view, which is not in the class. Uh, in the class, Craig pretty much stopped around Genesis 3, and he didn't go much beyond it, but he includes uh, a brief discussion of the flood and the Tower of Babel and some, and some things like that in the book. So again, good for him. Now, Craig... Craig's whole interpretation is, is that Genesis 1 through 11 is mytho-history, right? So within the context of the story, the author meant the flood to be global and days to be 24 hours, but the story as a general whole was not intended to be historical, is Craig's interpretation, okay? So he can actually agree with younger creationists on those very specific uh, points of, of those hermeneutical points. Uh, without accepting that the whole story is historical, okay? So that's important. Uh, point number four, um, Craig has a long section about the Hebrew word rakia, uh, and he, I believe he did mention this in uh, the class series, uh, but he goes into great detail in the book. It's a very long critique of the idea that the Hebrew word rakia means that the ancient people, Hebrews, thought there was a solid dome in the sky, and that implies a flat earth cosmology. That's a popular argument. You see it online all the time. Craig just absolutely obliterates this. Um, we already knew he didn't accept this idea, but in the book, he just he just blows this to smithereens. It's it's beautiful. This section of the book could be basically cut right out of the book and pasted into an article published by a Young Earth Creationist website. I mean, it's that good. Okay, that's number four. Uh, five would be, I might forget all of these points here. <laughs> five would be, oh yes, in the, sec, in the scientific part, part of the book, Craig spends an awful lot of time talking about paleontologic, paleontological, whatever, how you, however you say that, and archaeological evidence that Neanderthals especially, but also other uh, so-called pre-human hominid species that have been found, are in fact basically fully human. Cognitively, spiritually, these are human beings. Yes, there are phys differences in physical appearance, as you can see on the cover. That's I think that's supposed to be uh, Homo heidelbergensis. Um, Craig's what Craig the 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 species that Craig thinks Adam was. Um, but in general, this is a point of agreement with young Earth creationism. Uh, young Earth creationists have been arguing for decades and decades and decades, almost since the beginning of the modern creation science movement, that Neanderthals are human. They're human beings. And all these other so-called so pre-hominid ancestors are human beings. Um, now, the Australopithecines are interesting because um, 
if I recall correctly, young creation science has argued that Australopithecines are actually apes, and they're not human. But things like Homo erectus, probably Homo hyodelbergensis, certainly Neanderthals and Denisovans, which are important because we have DNA from those two groups, um, are, are fully human. And again, this is an agreement with creation science. Okay, so that's five. That's point number five, and that's really important. Craig spends a lot of time on this. Um, point number six is, this is probably the most interesting point. Uh, I'll just jump ahead and say point seven is uh, the, the simple fact that Craig accepts a historical atom. Again, in agreement with creation science, with young earth creationist position. Uh, the historical atom, and what he means by atom is he makes this very clear, is he means the historical Adam and Eve, but he's just going to shorten it to the historical Adam so he doesn't have to say the historical Adam and Eve all the time. Uh, this is one thing I really appreciate about Craig. He's not going to bow to all the woke stuff um, <laughs> and say, oh, I've got to include Eve, otherwise I'm you know, being discriminatory. No, he's just like, this is, this is a, a linguistic convention. Okay, guys, get over it and grow up. Good for him. Um, so point number six. This is probably the most interesting point, and I might spend quite a bit of time on this. Uh, this is the only slide you're going to see. I just slapped this together so I could do the video. Okay, so sorry if it's not super involved, but you know, at least this picture is pretty interesting to look at anyway. Um, point number six is in the class, if you remember, I believe this, I talked about this in episode uh, five, uh, where I talked about mytho-history directly. The genre that Craig claims Genesis is, is mytho-history. Um, in the class, Craig argued uh, that because the Genesis creation accounts in chapter 1 and chapter 2, she says are two different creation accounts, you know, which is obviously true. There's two different accounts of the creation of man and all the rest. In the class, Craig argues that there are inconsistencies between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and he says what they are. In the book, he says a couple in a couple places that there are inconsistencies in the two stories. Uh, but he doesn't get into the arguments about what those consistencies are. He, as far as I can tell, he has completely dropped the claim that... Um, in Genesis 2, it says that God made the animals, uh, you know, after man or something. Uh, right? So it says something like, and then God made man, and then God took the animals that he had formed and brought them to the man and had the man name the animals, basically. And so people have argued that animals in Genesis chapter 2 account were created after man, whereas in Genesis 1, they were created before the man. As far as I can tell, I haven't, I didn't see that anywhere in the book. Um, the other argument is that um, uh, the order of the plants being created. Now, in Genesis one, the plants are created on the third day, well before the creation of man. In Genesis two, it has been argued that. Because in the beginning of Genesis 2, it says, you know, and there were no plants of the field and herbs of the field because there was no man to cultivate the ground, but a mist came up from the ground to water the plants and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it basically says there, before the man existed, before the man was created, there was no man to water the ground, and so there were no plants of the field uh, and herbs of the field. There's two, there's two terms there, uh, two phrases Right, which is important. And so it's been argued that because Genesis 2 says there are no plants before man, that is a contradiction to the order of creation in Genesis 1, where the plants are created before the man. Okay. I address these arguments. Um, again, I believe it was in, in, in episode 5. Uh, 
But Craig has changed the argument slightly, and he has relegated it to a footnote. Okay, in the footnote, and it's not part of his main argument. So again, as I'll, as I'll talk about in the drive-by shooting section, <laughs> um, Craig often in this book has taken arguments that he thinks are weaker and put them in footnotes. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but the, the, in the footnote, Craig argues something that he did not argue in the class. He says that because of the phrase of the field after the, the plants in Genesis chapter 2, right? There's two phrases. It's like plants of the field and herbs of the field or something like that. And he says because of the phrase of the field, doesn't mean cultivated plants because it's used elsewhere to describe other things like the beasts of the field. And he specifically mentions the snake was the wiliest of the beasts of the field in, in chapter three. Um, and he says, so this phrase of the field doesn't mean cultivated. Well, of course, that's <laughs> uh, that's beside the point. It What matters is the entire phrase all taken together, not whether you can cut the phrase in in, in half and say it means something else someplace else. The whole phrase, and in the context of Genesis 2, which is clearly arguing that the reason there were no plants of the field and herbs of the field is because there was no man to work the fields. Okay, Now, young earth creationists have argued, in my opinion, they're correct about this, is that Clearly, in context, this means these two phrases are referred for referring to cultivated plants, not just plants in general. And therefore, there's no contradiction with the order of creation in Genesis 1. Craig has made his argument more sophisticated, but he's relegated it to a footnote, which in this context basically tells you he thinks this is not a, this is not a killer argument. <laughs> Now, the, main, the, sec, the sixth point of agreement is, we've already talked about number seven, the sixth point of agreement is, actually, and this is why I can tell that Craig doesn't think that this is a conclusive argument, is that in the main body of the book, uh, remember, the, the point of bringing up the inconsistencies between the two Genesis accounts is to argue that the two different creation accounts represent plasticity of the myth, that there are two different versions of the myth, and that means that the ancient Hebrews did not accept, did not believe this was historical because they were kind of playing fast and loose with two different versions of the myth. Okay? That's the argument he made in the class. In the book, in chapter 6, where he's addressing the question of whether or not Ancient peoples believed that myths were true. He's already established that Genesis is a myth. Okay, and we can. And I've actually argued in in this video series that young earth creationists could potentially agree, given Craig's definition of a myth, does not necessarily mean it's not historical. Okay, we could potentially agree with Craig's classification of Genesis as a myth. But it's a historical myth. It's a, a myth that was viewed as historical by the people uh, who believed it. Okay, and Craig is real clear in 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 the conclusion. I believe it's of chapter five of the book. Uh, but wherever he talks about this, in the, the very last thing he says is, "These were myths that were objects of belief for the ancient people. They believed it was true." Okay, now what do they mean by true? That's chapter 6. In chapter 6, he starts out, close to the beginning of the chapter, he describes what the criteria of plasticity and flexibility are. Okay, again, I discussed this in, in episode 5, I believe. Um, it might also be episode 6, somewhere around there. Plasticity and flexibility. Plasticity means alternate versions of the same myth existing relatively at the same time. And Craig is actually clearer about this in the book than he was in the class, which I'm thankful for. He says it's a syn synchronic flexibility or 
plasticity, synchronic at the same time, two different versions of the myth. Flexibility is diachronic, two different versions of the myth at different times, and which further implies that the ancient peoples changed the myth over time to accommodate new information. Okay, so a myth is, is about dealing with reality and explaining the way reality is in reference to the primordial past. That's the definition of etiology. An etiological myth is grounding present realities in the primordial past. Okay, But flexibility is an indication that it's a non-historical etiological myth because these ancient people will change the myth over time to accommodate new information, new pieces of reality that they learned since the myth was created and they changed the myth to adjust to the new reality. That's flexibility. In the class, I noted very specifically that Craig does not apply the criterion of flexibility to Genesis at all. Doesn't even try. He applies the criterion of plasticity to Genesis 1 and 2, claiming these are two different and inconsistent creation accounts. And we already went over that. In the book, in chapter 6, he talks about flexibility and plasticity, and then he launches into a long discussion of other ancient Near Eastern myths, Babylonian, Egyptian, Sumerian, everything. Myth after myth after myth, he's talking about over and over and over and over. Some of them he applies the criterion of plasticity and flexibility to show what they are. He talks about the um, uh, the Islander myth that I talked about in the video series about the temple and the nails and how they were trying to explain why they don't have iron nails in their temple. Um, but you can read that in the book or go watch the previous episodes. Um, he talks about that one, he talks about all these other ancient myths. And then at the end of this long discussion of all these myths, suddenly at the very end, he drops this bombshell. You cannot apply the criterion of plasticity or flexibility to Genesis because there's only one version of the text. Craig's basically, at that point, admitting that his argument that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are different versions of the creation myth doesn't hold. Okay, so he's giving up that argument. And he's admitting that the plasticity and flexibility criterion, which are the only two criterion that indicate non-historical non -historical etiological myth from historical etiological myth, doesn't apply to Genesis. That is a huge admission because it means essentially that Craig's only argument that Genesis is has any is non-historical at all. And by that he means, understand what he means here. He means clearly that the way the people, the ancient Hebrews viewed the myth, not the way he's assuming them it actually is. He's saying the way the ancient Hebrews understood the myth to be. Did they understand it as historical or not? The only arguments Craig has left to claim that they did not view this as historical are, in my opinion, highly subjective. Uh, they're the criterion of, well, there's lots of metaphorical language in it. Um, <clears throat> there's, fan, quote, fantastic unquote, elements of the story, which are, quote, palpably false, unquote. I've already discussed this, uh, how I think this is subjective criteria. Craig was, again, Craig was confronted with this in the class by a friendly member of the class who is an old earther and was friendly to him. But he noted that, you know, someone might object that this is an argument from personal incredulity. You know, based on your own background knowledge, you have decided that this is not believable, basically. This is, and Craig's response was, well, some things are incredible. Which was a really revealing response. Basically a non-response. You know, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll borrow a, a page from Joshua Swamidas's book here. It's a non-responsive response. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
but this is this is just huge. Craig has I can't emphasize this enough. His argument in the book is not as strong as the argument he made in the class. He has backed off. Wow. Okay, that's a big reveal. Um, so his whole argument now depends on whether or not you think that certain story elements in the Genesis 1 through 11 are palpably false or not. And Craig has given no objective criteria for determining that because there aren't any. And he almost he almost admits as much in the book. <laughs> he basically says you can't there's no objective criteria for determining what a myth is. Uh so you can't really evaluate whether something's a myth or not based on a criteria. You can only go by fam what quote, family resemblances. Whereas these other myths, we say they're myths, and we draw comparisons with with Genesis. Okay? Which is very interesting because in the in the class he went into great length explaining why uh, you remember Miller and Soden's view, I believe this is episode four that I of my series. Uh, certainly three at least, I think. Three, maybe four. Uh, where you know Miller and Soden have this view Genesis as a uh, theological polemic, and so they're critiquing other ancient creation myths. Right? Craig rejects this comparison, calls it parallelomania, trying to find all these parallels between um, ancient myths and Genesis. Now, this argument sort of appears in the book, but he doesn't use the word parallelomania. As far as I can recall, he doesn't mention Miller and Soden. Could, he might have in a footnote. Um, and the main argument, he doesn't mention Miller and Soden or the, or the polemic, the, the theological polemic interpretation at all in the book, which is really interesting because one of the arguments I made in the series was that, <laughs> that Craig's ultimate interpretation of Genesis is dependent on a theological interpretation of Genesis. But his hermeneutic, such as it is, it's a, not really a full hermeneutic, it's a genre analysis, more on that later, but this genre analysis doesn't support a theological interpretation of Genesis. Remember, Craig is saying this is an etiological myth, meaning it grounds present realities in the primordial past. So again, if the ancient Hebrews viewed it as a historical etiological myth, that is essentially the young earth creationist position. Okay, Because we, of course, believe that Genesis does ground present re realities in the primordial past. It explains the existence of human sin and the, the fallen nature of man. Um <clears throat> Explains why the universe exists, because God created it in Genesis. That's the explanation. Explains things like created kinds, you know, plate tectonics, the flood, all, you know, why uh, it explains human government in uh, Genesis 9, where it says, you know, if <clears throat> man sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. That's the basis of, that's the etiological basis of human government. Um, the basis of different languages in the Tower of Babel story, all this stuff, okay? <clears throat> I argued, actually, last episode, there may even be more interesting etiological elements of Genesis that explain current realities, like um, certain aspects of human society and government are the result of God limiting human lifespans to under 120 years. So that would also count as an etiological element. But, it matters if they believed it, it was historical or not, because if it's historical, then those are actually the real, true, historical, correct, accurate explanations of why things actually are the way they are. Okay, there has to be an actual, real explanation for why things are the way they are. You know, Earth creationists say Genesis is the real explanation. Okay, 
saying Genesis is an etiological myth, can't not stress this enough, is not the same thing as saying Genesis is not historically accurate. In fact, it tends to agree, it tends to support the historical interpretation. <clears throat> so anyway, in my opinion, Craig does not make his case. It is even weaker of a case than in the class because he backs off of the crucial points. <laughs> and instead, he desperately goes through a large number of ancient myths trying to show the family resemblances between these other myths and Genesis, which is why he doesn't mention his parallelomania argument, because that would tend to undermine the only case he has left for saying it's non-historical. <laughs> so I'll probably end up saying this again, but this book is a master class in how to argue a losing position. <laughs> this is uh, OJ's defense lawyer arguing that if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. That's what this book is. <laughs> There were multiple times where I just sort of had to chuckle out loud reading the book. I was just like, this is amazing. And I, I really do appreciate uh, the genius level argumentation in this book. Uh, as a debater, a very accomplished debater, you know, Craig's, Craig's debating skills go back, I think, to high school. He was on the debate team, certainly in college. I know he was. And the absolute most skilled debating accomplishment that you can have is winning a debate with a losing position. <laughs> and so debaters know this. And so they're like, you know, they love to try and uh, argue losing positions uh, because that speaks to your skill as a debater. If you can, if you can debate uh, that anyway that's what this book is to me it's it's the it's a master class in arguing a losing position how to argue it because of just all the subtle details of how craig presents things the things that he has clearly dropped from the class like the parallelomania like the strong argument against the theological polemic interpretation again craig does not affirm it in the book he hasn't changed. It doesn't appear that he's changed his mind. He's just dropped it from his argument because he realized it undermined his point. The only point he has left is to compare ancient myths with Genesis to convince people that they they share family resemblances, that they're the same, and therefore it must not be historical. Even though he doesn't have a great case that the ancient peoples believed it to be non-historical which is the only hermeneutical point that matters. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> One of my favorite movies is called Thank You for Smoking. And it's about a... The main character is played by Aaron Eckhart. It's just brilliant. He plays a tobacco lobbyist. Um, you know, I think it would be in the early 90s when... when there was this big controversy about whether tobacco caused cancer or not. Smoking caused cancer. And there's all the Surgeon General warnings and stuff like that. Okay. <clears throat> this is a tobacco lobbyist who is trying to argue a losing position. Smoking does not cause cancer. It's not bad for you. So go ahead and smoke all you want. Okay. And, you know, it's implicit throughout the movie that the character understands that this is bullcrap <laughs> but he doesn't care because it's his job to argue the position and the key quote from the movie is you know he's talking to his son and his son is like trying to figure out like you know you're my dad and you're a good guy you know and you love me and i can't i can't reject you as my dad he's not saying this it's just clear he's struggling with realizing what his father does for a living. <laughs> and his father is just like, okay, look, son, here's the deal. As long as you argue correctly, 
you're never wrong. <laughs> as long as you argue correctly, you're never wrong. You can argue from a losing position and not be wrong in the things you say. Okay? <laughs> you can argue for a false position and never be and never be able to be proven wrong. That's the beauty of argumentation. Okay? As long as you do it correctly, people can't prove you wrong. Okay? <laughs> That should be the that should be the thesis statement of this book. Uh, the real thesis statement of this book, actually, in my opinion, probably not Craig's opinion, but uh, it's where he basically he says he's talking about myths. Uh, if I can remember this, uh, he's talking about myths, and he says basically a myth. I'm paraphrasing here. I wish I had the full quote. Uh, one second, I might be able to actually get it here. A myth, it has something to do with myths have to change to match reality. Um, so anyway, that's the basic point, is that when a myth comes up against reality, it's the myth that must change. Okay, that's the gist of it. When a myth comes up against reality, it's the myth that changes. Okay? So read in that light, Craig has already admitted that the myth of Genesis did not change until very recently. Okay? And his excuse for this in the book is an argument he did not make in the class. His excuse for this in the book is, well, it turns out when the, the invention of writing basically screwed me over. <laughs> because as soon as these ancient peoples figured out how to write down things, those, gosh darn it, they figured out how to write. <laughs> and so when they figured out how to write, they wrote down the myth, and now they just can't change it anymore. <laughs> Even if they wanted to, they couldn't change it anymore because it was written down. Oh no, that's terrible. <laughs> because, gosh darn it, if they hadn't figured out how to write, they would have changed the myth and I could prove that I was right. And that the myth is plastic and flexible. Or in that case, it would be flexible mostly. But because they figured out how to write... The myth is now set in stone, and I can't prove that it's plastic or flexible because there's no alternate written versions of it. I can't find any other different versions of it, but it's got to be a non-historical myth anyway. <laughs> Those darn ancient Hebrews and their writing. <laughs> Because they wrote it down, it didn't change until very, very recently. And again, Craig doesn't argue this, but it's almost like he's suggesting that the very fact that um, revisionist interpretations of Genesis, modern interpretations of Genesis, where people are reinterpreting it, is proof that it's not historical. <laughs> because we reinterpret Genesis... Well, guess what? That means it's the, it's a myth because we're changing it. We're changing how we interpret it. And <clears throat> that's not explicitly made in the book because those I'm talking about two different places in the book that are far removed from each other. Um, where in the one part, he's talking about the writing stuff, and he's basically saying that... <clears throat> um, he quotes another scholar here, saying that, you know, once, once these ancient peoples write the myth down, the the changes in the myth don't occur in the actual text. They occur 
in the interpretation of the text. So it's the interpretation of the text now that indicates the mythical nature of the myth, right? So you reinterpret it instead of rewriting the myth and telling a different version of it to accommodate a new reality. You reinterpret it to accommodate a new reality. Well, okay, that's fine, right? Did the ancient Hebrews reinterpret Genesis to accommodate new realities? No. Greg has no evidence of this. And so it's almost like he's suggesting that because we're reinterpreting the myth to accommodate new realities, okay, that means our reinterpretation is evidence that it's a myth. <laughs> Again, I have to emphasize, Craig did not make that argument, but it almost seems like he's trying to suggest it, okay? That's why this is this is just a masterclass in arguing a losing position, uh, because he's trying to get people to draw conclusions that are not warranted without himself actually being liable for, for, making, for drawing those conclusions himself. <laughs> Oh, he's trying to suggest that it's true, but he knows he can't support it. So he's trying to be so gently subject suggestive that he can't be accused of making the argument. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, wow. <laughs> And of course, the main point here, and I'll, I'll move to the drive-by shootings in a second. Sorry, it's been way too long. It's, I didn't intend to do it this long. Anyway, the main point here is simply that, and now I lost my train of thought. This is what you get when you get a hot take. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, okay, the main point here is that how... How does Craig define what is real? How does Craig define what is reality? Okay, what has changed about reality since the distant past? Okay, I believe Moses was on Mount Sinai. God told him this story. He wrote it down. Uh, he, he may have been drawing on uh, previous oral traditions and writing it down, but God was guiding this process. If there is any part of the Bible that has more of a claim to being the direct words of God than Genesis, or at least the Pentateuch. You know, I can't find any. Because in the Pentateuch, Moses says, right, I think this is in Exodus, right? So the only scripture prior to Exodus is Genesis. So really, it's Genesis, not just the Pentateuch. In Exodus, Moses comes down the mountain with stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. Now, this has traditionally been interpreted as the Ten Commandments, but that's not what the text says, okay? We know from Exodus that Moses, and, and again, Craig affirms the rest of Scripture is history, not mytho-history. Okay, so he has to affirm this. that Moses came down from the mountain, Mount Sinai, unless he makes a separate argument here, he had stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God himself. God wrote it directly. Okay? And there is actually no better passage to be the case for what God wrote down directly than Genesis chapter 1. Why? Because there were no humans alive then. The only way we could possibly know what happened prior to humans being around is if God told somebody. And obviously, it's got to be Moses. Okay? Genesis 1, written with the finger of God himself, is, is a good case. Okay? Now, Genesis 2 could be based on oral tradition uh, descending all the way from Adam. And here, an argument Craig has made previously is actually helps the young earth creationist case. He says, well, Shem would have still been alive. Shem, Noah's son, would have been alive when Abraham was born. In fact, Shem outlives Abraham in the genealogy. So what? That means uh, a more accurate transmission of these ancient oral traditions. That's a strength of the young earth creationist. 
position. Um, but Craig just means that, oh, well, it's palpably false. That couldn't be true. <clears throat> um, anyway, uh, but the main point here is that Craig's interpretation of what counts as reality is science. Science tells him so, therefore it must be real. Science defines reality for Craig, and this is just patently obvious throughout the book. Um, you know, read the book. You can't you can't escape that conclusion. Craig is defining what is real by modern science. And because modern science has told us, okay, what is real, we have to reinterpret this myth. That is not proper hermeneutics. You need to interpret the story according to what the ancient peoples believed it to mean. You can't just say, well, this is our myth now, and we can make it mean whatever we need it to mean to accommodate new realities. You can't just make the myth flexible yourself. Okay? You have to take this as what they meant it to mean, if you're being actually scholarly. <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> But this is pretty clearly the thesis statement of the book, even if Craig doesn't realize it. It's that, you know, myths, <clears throat> when, they, when they run up against reality, the myth changes to match reality. And that's what Craig is trying to do in this whole book. He's trying to change the Genesis. He's trying to reinterpret the Genesis myth to match what he understands to be reality defined by science. And he's trying desperately to pretend that's not what he's doing. Because he knows that's improper hermeneutics. And it's not a good case besides, anyway. <clears throat> I don't I don't I don't really know where Craig is on this. I I I think he might be in he could be in the process of changing his mind. Of course, writing the book in an ironic twist is going to force him to defend the book. The fact that he put this down in writing, just like Genesis, right, means now he has to defend the text of the book. So it's possible this will limit further change on, on Craig's part in exactly the same way he argues that it limits change on Genesis. Oh, it's such a bad thing that they invented writing. <laughs> oh. I'm 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 very happy about this book. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, let's move on. I've belabored this point way too much. Drive-by shootings. It is a common occurrence in this book, where Craig blows by huge issues with in a single sentence or single paragraph without mentioning all the stuff he's assuming. One of the more obvious uh, examples of this is where he talks about, where he affirms that the days in Genesis 1 are 24 hours. Just blows by it in a single paragraph without even mentioning alternative views, basically. It's just like, whatever, these are 24 hours, let's move on. <laughs> there's, a, there's so many examples of this, I'm just not going to be able to remember all of them. Uh, one example of this is when he's talking about in the science section, he's talking about Neanderthals and all that. <laughs> um, he just he ta he talks about a couple of different uh, proteins where scientists have shown that a single point mutation. I'm assuming it's a point mutation. Craig doesn't. I, I don't think he uses the word point mutation. Um, he just says mutation. Craig doesn't engage with bio biology stuff that much. But I'm assuming it's. Without looking at the papers, I'm assuming it's SMP, single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, point mutation. Um, but in you know, in, uh, an SMP doesn't necessarily lead to an amino acid change, so it has to be an, a single amino acid change. There's such a thing as silent mutations. We don't need to get into that um, because there's three nucleotides that code for amino acid, and the genetic code is what's called redundant. Uh, or, or degenerate is the scientific term for it, which is a misnomer, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, 
you, you, you have a single amino acid change in a couple of different proteins that affect brain development. Okay, and he's arguing that uh, basically that the, this shows that complex features can arise through very simple mutations. And then he just blows on, <laughs> just runs right past this statement, and I'm sitting here thinking, there's no reference here. There's no support for the statement. He just says, complex features can arise through very simple mutations. <laughs> Moves right on by. And I, and I like red flags everywhere. I know a bunch of intelligent design theorists who would vociferously argue otherwise and have been for 20, 30 years. <laughs> and they've made a very good case on this. In fact, such a good case, I think it's basically at this point. Uh, the argument's over. Um, we, well, I want to talk about that maybe uh, maybe later. I've discussed it in the Sunday School class videos. But Craig just blows by this as if this is not a huge assumption. Uh, you know, and even if it's possible that certain brain development things, and, you know, they put these... Uh, slightly changed proteins in rats and said, oh, look, it increases, you know, the brain development of the neocortex or the whatever, basal ganglia, or them, I don't know, I don't remember exactly the details, but um, in ferrets and rats, it, it showed that, you know, massively changed brain development. Well, guess what? The brain is an organ just like anything else, okay? Um, it's a physical organ. It's not super surprising that if you change the basic building blocks of a brain, it will change the way it develops. Craig leans heavily into Evo Devo here. In fact, <laughs> again, this is another drive-by shooting that I just remembered. Uh, Craig actually suggests he actually refers to recapitulation theory and just blows by it like this is not, oh, well, sometimes, uh, you know, embryonic development recapitulates this. He uses the word recapitulate. Oops. Um, there's a little preview of a previous episode that has already been done. But... Um, he just blows by this, like this is like he's suggesting recapitulation theory, which has been thoroughly debunked. Again, by intelligent design theorists, by creationists, this is this is not even a viable theory according to evolutionists anymore. Uh, it's not held or believed, but Craig like puts it out there, like recapitulation theory, which the statement is. Um, uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which basically means development of an embryo goes through the historical stages of your previous, the previous evolution of the species of the embryo. <laughs> it's like, okay, dude, <laughs> whatever. This this requires support. You know, we can't just can't just claim this and run off act like this is not uh, that this is something that everybody just accepts. That's not the case. Um, there's a number of, of places in the book where Craig does this. Um, another one is uh, he does spend a little time with some critiques of young earth creationism. He claims that uh, young Earth creationists can't account for the number of species in the world today because of the limited number that were on the ark. Uh, this has been dealt with in detail by, for example, Nathaniel Jensen in his book Replacing Darwin, and shows how that's not the case. He's and Craig Craig Grace basically refers to Hugh Ross for his criti critiques of young Earth creationism. So make of that what you will. I don't think that Hugh Ross is an excellent critic at all. Uh, he claims there are 5.8 million land species. Uh, you know, read Nathaniel Jensen's book on this. And, and there's plenty of other creationist responses to this. This is not a, this is not a difficult objection to uh, answer. Um, 
The fact is, is that we have observed speciation events, and Nathaniel Jensen makes a good case that for uh, a rate of speciation that has been not directly observed, but you can infer it from what we have observed. Um, and so, you know, this rate of speciation is easily able to account for the amount of species that exist. If one assumes uh, that, that the uh, genus or family or the biblical kind rather was on the ark and had uh, genetic vari variations already in it, um, anyway, uh, the other objection Craig makes is mystifying. I don't understand this, where he's getting this. He claims that uh, young earth creationism requires, requires that all the biological diversity of the dinosaurs must have evolved between the flood and the time of Abraham. Nobody understands where he is getting this. All creation scientists believe that the biological diversity of dinosaurs, which we only know about because it's in the fossil record, is pre-flood because those fossils were laid down during the flood. It's a snapshot of the diversity that existed at the time of the flood. No young earth creationist believes that that biological diversity emerged after the flood. Nobody knows what Craig is talking about here. The only possible answer is that he's got it wrong slightly. There is a controversy in creation science about the in the geologic column where the flood layers end. Where, what's the last sedimentary layer laid down by the flood? <clears throat> and what are the layers laid down after the flood? Um, so some people say it's the KPG boundary, which is the um, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary or KT boundary. Um, others argue that the boundary is higher, uh, the NQ boundary, Neo Neogene Quaternary boundary. Uh, I prefer the latter position. Tim Clary at ICR has been excellent on this. He's been publishing prodigiously on this, arguing, in my view, very convincingly that the actual flood, post flood boundary is at the Neogene Quaternary boundary. Okay? Uh, so check that out. Um, lots of papers in the Young Earth Creationist literature on this. Um, but if you take the lower boundary, the KPG boundary, that means whales come into the fossil record and a few other things like bats and, and I think certain kinds of monkeys um, come into the fossil record only after the KPG boundary. Okay. Now, regardless, though, of whether you hold to the KPG boundary or NQ boundary, two things are true. Virtually all the hominid fossils in the record occur above the boundary, either the KPG or NQ, it doesn't matter, post-flood fossils. So Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo erectus, all the rest occur after the flood. Okay. Um, also, all dinosaurs occur before the flood, no matter which boundary you choose. Okay. So when Craig says that dinosaurs, all the entire history of dinosaur evolution must have occurred between the flood and the time of Abraham, he is not correctly representing the creation science position. I don't know what he is talking about there. It makes no sense. He doesn't understand creation science. I've said this before. He doesn't care to. He doesn't read the literature. He refers to Hugh Ross primarily as his source for creation science, which Hugh Ross is an old earth creationist who critiques creation science. Okay, He's not referring to young earth creationist literature at all, except for Sarfati's book, The Genesis Account, which he gives evidence that he probably hasn't read it carefully, at least. Um, this is really frustrating. So that's another drive-by shooting. It's there is an argument going around. There's a there's a guy named Joel Duff who makes this argument a lot as a critic 
of Young Earth Creationism that you guys accept whale evolution after the flood uh, because of the earlier KPG boundary. If, if you hold to the NQ boundary, you don't have this issue. But you guys accept that whales evolved from bovines or whatever, land mammals. Um, and so you're really evolutionists. You believe in evolution already. You know, you've given up the game, is, is Joel Duff's argument. Okay, well, um, ICR, because of Tim Clary, is basically moving towards the NQ boundary. I predict this will become the consensus in the future in the Young Earth Creationist literature. Uh, Tim Clary's arguments are just, are just, in my opinion, absolutely convincing on this. Um, of course, you don't necessarily, if you hold to the KPG boundary, you don't necessarily have to assume that whales evolved from land mammals. You could say that whales survived the flood and weren't fossilized in the flood. You could say something like that. You could also say that the evolution was not Darwinian or naturalistic. It was directed evolution or perhaps... Um, you know, front loading or something like that. I don't think any of those are good cases, but you don't necessarily have to give away the whole evolutionary game the way Duff argues. Um, so this is my only explanation for Craig's misinterpretation, misrepresentation here. He thinks he's got the argument correctly, but because he focuses on dinosaurs, it's just totally wrong. <laughs> it has nothing to do with dinosaurs, man. Um, it has to do with the fossils that occur in the in the record above the KPG boundary, and that's only if you hold to the KPG boundary as the flood post flood boundary, which I think is not going to be the case in the future. Anyway, I I just think Craig just doesn't understand something here. Um, another drive by. See, I'm trying to remember. There's one more big one. That I remember. Oh well. Anyway, there's there's lots of these in the book, and so many of them occur in footnotes, which I talked about before. If there's an argument that Craig thinks he has a response for, he'll present it in the narrative of the book as though he's being fair-minded and considering all sides. But if there's an argument, oh, this is the one I wanted to talk about. <laughs> we'll end with this. I know this is getting really long. Uh, we'll end with this. Okay. In his argument from the New Testament, which again, the reason Craig affirms the historical Adam is because of New Testament passages like Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. Okay? And because he, he dis distinguishes between asserting something in the, in the text and illustrating something. So an illustrative purpose is, well, you could be referring to a fictional story to illustrate a point, right? Well, you're like Thanos because you're evil and you want to kill everybody. Okay, that's an example of an illustrative purpose. I, again, I've talked about this in previous episodes. Again, I think this was episode five. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, and so he says, but Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 do not make sense in the text unless the historical Adam and Eve exist. So he affirms the historical Adam and Eve on the basis of the New Testament passages, not the Old Testament passages, which is a super awkward position. He calls it the literary Adam in Genesis, but the historical Adam is only found in the New Testament. Even though, even though, it's pretty dang obvious that the New Testament authors get everything they know about Adam from Genesis. <laughs> So it's a super awkward position to be in to say that, well, we only believe in the historical Adam because, you know, Paul affirms it in Romans, even though Paul's referring to Genesis, but Genesis doesn't affirm the historical Adam. So, but because Paul does, we have to believe it. Oh, man. And, and also because science tells us what reality is and science allows it. So we're okay there. If science allows it, we can affirm it. Uh, science is not the arbiter of reality guys <laughs> <laughs>
just put that out there. Uh, and we may have to discuss that in a separate episode. That's a huge issue. Craig does refer, this is one of the drive-bys actually, Craig does use the word paradigm in the book, uh, which is an indicator of uh, Thomas Kuhn's philosophy of science and his seminal book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which argued again that, you know, paradigms are important in science, but they're not necessarily grounded deductively, and so you can't prove that they're correct. Craig uses the word paradigm to cr criticize young earth creationism and say, you guys don't have a viable paradigm, so blah. Well, guess what? <laughs> if, you're, if you're accepting the paradigm language, you're accepting that the paradigm has nothing to do with truth. If it's a viable paradigm, it doesn't mean it's true. If it's a non-viable paradigm, scientifically, it doesn't mean it's false. Again, uh, there's a whole universe of argument there that he just blows by. <laughs> anyway, we'll get back to the, the New Testament. And I, I promised I'd end with this. Um In the same manner in which Craig argues that the New Testament of passage asserts the historical Adam in the, in the sense that his, the argument and the thing that he's saying is true, Paul in Romans 5, that is, the thing that he's saying is true there doesn't make any sense unless Adam is actually historical. Okay? In the same sense, I argued, okay, again, episode 5 is the key episode here, that... Second Peter chapter 3 says, Peter makes the argument that, you know, look, the end of the world is coming. But people say, nah, the end of the world isn't coming. Things are just going on as they have before. And Peter says, but they forget, deliberately forget, that God destroyed the world with a flood. And this proves that things do not continue on as they are always continuing on and therefore you know they're wrong in this objection to the end of the world that is coming peter's argument does not make sense without an actual historical worldwide globe destroying flood and craig has admitted that the flood account in genesis means a global flood that means he has no counter argument to Second Peter three. The only counter argument to Second Peter three is to claim that well, in Second Peter three he's talking about a flood that killed all people, but not didn't destroy the whole world. It's not a global flood. That's the that's the argument Hugh Ross makes, but Craig has specifically rejected Ross's position on the flood. He says the flood in Genesis is global. That means he can't argue the flood Peter is talking about isn't a global flood, because Peter is obviously referring to the Genesis flood. Okay? So by the logic, Craig's own logic, that he affirms a historical Adam, according to Second Peter 3, he has to affirm a global flood actually existed historically and happened. That's huge. But guess what? Craig makes a huge argument based on 2 Peter 2. He spends a lot of time on 2 Peter chapter 2. And then right in the narrative, you'll, you, you can just completely miss this in the narrative of the book. He skips ahead to 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 19. It says, well, blah, 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 blah. 2 Peter 3, 19. 2 Peter 2. Let's just skip this thing in between. Boom. <laughs> Drive by shooting. Now he does mention 2 Peter 3 verses 1 through 7 in a footnote. Again with a footnote. He relegates the counter arguments to a footnote when he feels he can't ignore them but has no answer. And bringing, up, bringing it up in the regular narrative might point people to holes in his argument. <laughs> but he puts it in a footnote so he cannot be accused of not addressing 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7. <laughs> this is just brilliant. 
brilliant. But of course, he doesn't address the main point that I just made in the footnote. I can't even remember what the footnote says, but it doesn't address this point, is that Craig is being inconsistent if he doesn't affirm a historical global flood based on 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Anyway, that's the last drive-by. Read the book. It's <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, Craig's thinking is, is, you know, there's a lot of things that are valuable about the book. His discussion of myth is valuable. Uh, Craig has changed, I think, slightly his position on what is a myth and what isn't. In the class, he said that my definition of myth that I'm using is from the professional folklorists, and it's not the same definition as C.S. Lewis uses when C.S. Lewis talks about the Gospels as being a true myth. This was brought up in the class. Um, in the book, however, Craig never denies the comparison between C.S. Lewis's version and understanding of a true myth and Craig's understanding of a, of a true myth. Uh, in fact, he specifically says the lines are somewhat blurred. And again, in a footnote, <laughs> in a footnote, he actually references Lewis's essay called The Funeral of a Great Myth, where Lewis says, look, the myth, evolution, the caveman, everything, that's a myth, a, a, a popular myth. And specifically, it's not a true myth, right? Craig Lewis understands the difference between a true myth and, and a not true myth. Craig seems to blur the lines a little bit about what the definition of a myth is, and I think his thinking on this has has evolved a little bit. Um. <laughs> anyway, it's a very interesting book. Uh, it's difficult to actually see what Craig really thinks. Um. I think he really does have uh, antipathy, toward, antipathy towards creation science. That much is true, because his arguments against creation science are always unfair. Uh, they're, they're uh, I want to say vituperative, but I can't remember exactly what that word means. Let's say vehement. <laughs> um, and he keeps saying over and over, and he said this in a recent podcast after the book's release, says, look, if young earth creationist hermeneutic of Genesis is true, we're all screwed. <laughs> because that would mean scripture is asserting the truth of something that we know is false. The standard for truth and falsehood being science. Science says this is, can't be true. If Genesis teaches young earth, that's, that's it. The Bible is teaching error, and we're, we're screwed. <laughs> oh, he's just flat out admitting that his standard for truth is science, not the Bible, not God's word. And, and uh, which he knows is a bad hermeneutical principle, which is why he orders the book. And he says this, states this in the book. Well, I presented the biblical hermeneutic first, which is not a hermeneutic. He doesn't have an interpretation of Genesis, not a real one. It's theological. His, his 10 points about what Genesis really means, 1 through 11, is theological. There, I, and I already discussed this. There are not different points that he made in the class, but it's not supported by his genre analysis. He hasn't made a gr good case. He, he does make a slightly better case in this book that there are theological interpretations of myth. But in my opinion, it's not a good case. Okay, The, the myth, the Craig's idea remains that it's an etiological myth, grounding current realities in the primordial past. And if that's what it is, and if they believed it was true, and he has no argument, no solid argument that it's not historical, I mean, that's young earth creationism. Okay. <laughs> he comes about as close to it as you can without being one. The only problem left is Craig, Craig just can't accept that science may not be absolutely correct about everything. <laughs> I don't, or, 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 or he doesn't believe that, but he's saying, like, in our current situation, the scholarly situation is science says this, and therefore if we can't interpret the Bible to be in accord with it, then that means we're screwed and we just 
we don't have an intellectually defensible position. It may not be his, his position on what he believes. And again, it's hard to tell what he believes for sure um, on all of this because his argument is so muddled. But anyway, um, I, I, I better stop there. This is just could just go on forever. So anyway, it's an interesting book. I'd recommend it. Um, in the future, I'm going to be basically doing what I planned on doing before, looking at parts 27 through 34 and loosely talking about intelligent design a little bit, probably progressive creation a lot. We're going to talk about Molinism and how Craig plans to use Molinism to reconcile evolutionary theory with uh, the doctrine of creation, which I think doesn't work. Um, uh, we're, there's also going to be, later this month, there's going to be a class, actually, that Craig is doing at Houston Baptist University. It's an online class. It lasts for a week. It's about three hours every night for five days, uh, for, a, for weekdays. And so I'm going to be attending that class, and it should be interesting. I'll be able to act, act, ask Craig questions directly about the book. I've got a whole list of questions, some of which I did not address here. I'm going to surprise him. <laughs> but it should be fun. It should be fun. Um, you know, I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm kind of like, you know, this is this is fun for me. You know, it doesn't make me upset. I'm a little bit upset about his critiques of creation science, which are just flat out wrong in some cases. Um, just completely doesn't care what creation science says. It doesn't engage with it at all. But anyway, um, so that'll be fun. I'm not sure if I'll make another video before the class or not. Um, I may not discuss the class in videos just because it's kind of supposed to be a private thing where you pay and show up and, and uh, you know, experience that um, live. But we'll see. Um, anyway, that's it for now. Uh, later. Thanks for listening.